you know, as humans, we have this real sort of tendency to take something really simple and complicate the crap out of it and make it really <laughs> difficult and add rules and qualifiers and filters and, and confirmations and all these sorts of things that we do as traders when we really don't necessarily have to do that. Two traders, Darren and Walter, pull back the curtain on profitable trading systems, consistent money management, and profitable psychological triggers. Welcome to the Two Traders Podcast. Welcome to the Two Traders Podcast. Walter Peters here, and I've got Darren. Hello, Darren. Hello, Walter. We are going to talk today about breaking your trading rules. Now, the question is... Does it even matter if you're breaking your trading rules? So is this something that we should be concerned about as traders? Where do you sit on the fence, Darren? Which side are you on this one? I am 100% that you should never break any of your trading rules. And the reason is, is because I think you have to appreciate that trading is not a hundred percent skill endeavor it's a mixture of skill and luck when there's luck involved and there's actually a lot of luck involved in um, trading I would say as much luck as there is skill and when that's the case then real edges can only be found over the long term and anything you find that works in the short term is likely just more than likely just luck so when our edges are found over the long term, it's very hard to keep those ideas in your mind in the short term and you're likely to kind of miss the point of your strategy. So if you imagine a trend trader, okay, if he just looked a very small sample of data and drew his rules from that, you're, you're basically kind of curve fit into the period you're looking at. OK, and what's not what what isn't happening there is good luck and bad luck aren't re really being allowed to to play out. And you're not defining rules that deal with the fact that there's going to be a, a lot of luck um, affecting your results. Although the idea is that we can, you know, as we get better, we can learn the skill to make better decisions than, than our rules define. I don't believe that's true and I know I'm kind of contradicting myself here because in the past I I have you know always said that um you know we can teach the brain to to become more skillful and we can learn things with experience but there is a limit to that as well and really you kind of need that structure of of rules to make sure you make profit in the long run and that's what we're all trying to to achieve so yeah, in my mind, you, you have to have rules defined. Those rules can have some options, some discretion if you like, um, but they need, you know, that even the discretion needs to be clearly defined and you need to stick to those over the long run if you want to survive and make a consistent profit. Yeah, that's, that's I definitely agree. I think probably the the one thing that separates the successful traders from the ones who are still sort of trying to make it work, I believe, is that the successful traders have figured out a way so that they follow their rules more often. So, and if you don't have any rules, then then you're just, you're not really a trader. Like, <laughs> you're just making mistakes. You're just one mistake after another because who knows whether or not you're doing the right thing. So kind of, sort of like rules set you up to know what you need to do to make profit and to follow some sort of strategy. So you've got to define that strategy with your rules. And then the successful traders, more often than not, follow their rules. That's, that's what I believe. And beyond that, that part where you're talking about the luck, I think that comes into play when you're talking about your sequence of winners and losers. So, for example, if I were a person that only likes to bet on roulette and I bet, I go into the casino and I only bet on black. I don't bet on any of the numbers. So, with the way that roulette works, most people probably know or some people may listening may know you can bet on a number and if if your number comes up you get a big payout if you can bet on a color red or black and if that comes up you get a 
a rather small payout. And then uh, you can bet on sections, like a third of the numbers or, or whatever, that sort of thing, or, or two numbers at once or whatever. But if you're a person who says, look, I just bet on the black numbers, and you happen to walk in the casino, you happen to walk up to the table, and you happen to start betting on black as a run of blacks come up, black numbers come up over and over again, then that just means that you were a little bit lucky. If you keep betting on black, you know, from now until, you know, uh, you know, for the next decade, you're going to lose because it's a, it's a losing, you have a losing expectancy betting on, well, just about any bet. <laughs> Just about any bet in the casino has a losing is a losing strategy, but but that's definitely a losing one too. You just happen to walk in at the right time, and the same thing can happen for our trading, and that's why I believe Monte Carlo analysis is so valuable for traders because you get kind of these upper and lower ranges of let's see what would happen if I was really lucky when I started trading this system versus not so lucky, and so you you kind of can see the range of what's likely to happen given how lucky you are. And I believe that luck mostly translates into the sequence of your winners and your losers and how, how those how those come up. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. That's that's how I see it as well. And you know, it's um it's an interesting point is that people like to think that you can break some of the rules and you know, really, you need to examine the motives behind wanting to break the rules to understand why it's it's not a good idea. You know, in the, in the short term, our short term expectations are usually disappointed by the reality of the long term expectations of our of our strategy. So, you know, there is that constant desire to perform better than than is to be expected to win more often than is to be expected so there is a constant urge to break rules and almost kind of build a bit of a story around what's happening to kind of back that up whereas really what we should always be listening to is the long-term narrative the one that we tested the one that we know has a slight edge over a long period of time and then hopefully we can you know capitalize on the good luck and avoid too much damage from any bad luck and and that's really is what your rule set should do it should protect you from the the worst times and and mean that you capitalize in the good times I know I always bring up Dunn Capital, but if you think about Dunn Capital, who've been going for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, trend trading strategies, really successful. We know they're highly skilled. He must have his strategy down to a T. He must know how to read trends and how to capitalize on them. But still, he has losing years. How is it possible that someone so skilled with all of that expertise, probably the best traders working for him, computers knowledge information still can have losing years and that is because the, of this luck element as well and what has kept him profitable over the the long run will most likely be the fact that he's got a rule set and he sticks to it and he knows that it's not always going to um, work out in his favor in the long run it's going to make sure he makes money it's going to increase his chances of making money yeah, and he's not focusing on on the win rate. He's not. That's not his focus, right? I mean, I think there's a couple of brothers, right, or something like that. Anyway, so the other day in one of my test accounts, I had twenty five percent profit. I had a, what basically what happened was a bunch of trades were triggered all around the same week, and I had a lot of them that were sitting in profit. Now, I could have closed them all out and booked a 25% profit, but I didn't do that. And the reason why I didn't do that, because I knew that I needed to follow my rules. I needed to do what I should do to increase the average winner and decrease the average loser. Now, some people would look at that and say, well, you can't go broke by taking a profit. Why didn't you take all of those trades off the board and, and book the 25% profit? And some of those trades actually ended up being losers and some good chunk of them ended up being break-even results. A few of them are still on now and I'm still waiting for them to hit the four to one target. Now, it seems kind of weird that you would give up and, and not book the 25% profit and now I'm up something like 8% on those trades. And, and who knows what's going to happen with those trades. They may never hit the target. But the point is, the reason why I did that was because I know that the edge in my system comes from having a large 
winner, an average winner that's larger uh, than my average loser. And the only way that happens is if I stick to my rules and wait for these trades to get to the point where they're, you know, they're ready to cash out at the at the big fat profit. And so this is one of the things that I think tr traders who've been doing this for a long time, they have a different perspective. Like you say, Darren, they're looking at chunks of trades. They're looking at the long term. They're looking at trying to fatten up their profitable trades, especially when they don't have a high win rate. And so this is really where your edge is as a trader. It's in focusing on the execution and focusing on making sure that when you are right, that you really take advantage of that. And so you don't have to be right that often. And it, it goes, it really does go against, it goes counter to all of our human sort of needs to be right, to be a winner, to take advantage of the situation, to dig your heels in and do what you can to win. You know, all of these things that might serve us well in business don't, you know, or, or other areas or athletics or other areas of life just doesn't work with trading. You got to learn how to lose and you got to focus on the big picture and not really worry about how lucky or unlucky you've been this week, this month, this quarter, this year. It's not that important. And I think that's kind of what Dunn Capital does. Those brothers in Florida, you know, they understand that, uh, you know, they may have a few trades a year that really make up all for all the losers they have. They may be in a situation where it's very difficult to keep taking these trades, especially when you've had so many losers in a row, but they know that that's not really the important thing. The important thing is that they capture those big winners when they do come up. So I guess from my point of view, the advice that I would offer is that as a trader, if you can focus on execution and focus on your rules, then you're going to be performing at a higher level of efficiency. You're going to be making more more likely to be making money if you have a positive expectancy system. Um, you would be more likely to be making money than those traders who are focused on other things, which are, which are not rules, which are other reasons to change the system or improve the win rate or uh, listen to what so and so is saying about the pound and this and that. You know, you know, these are the sorts of distractions that keep us from making money. And 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 really, if we can just focus on following our rules, then everything else will follow. But that's kind of my point of view is that it's so difficult because we're not built to take advantage of our trading system rules. We're really kind of built to look at other things like win rate and you know, reasons to tweak things. You know, as humans, we have this real sort of tendency to take something really simple and complicate the crap out of it and make it really <laughs> difficult and add rules and qualifiers and filters and, and confirmations and all these sorts of things that we do as traders when we really don't necessarily have to do that. Do you think that is because a successful strategy is always generally disappointing when what we hold in our mind, what we envisage as being our trading results when we're finally successful? Is it because those kind of strategies really are not as exciting as we, we'd hope they'd be? They're, they're not as much in other words, there's not enough, there's not as much alpha out there as, as people think there is. Um, so you're going to be sort of trading much closer to the sort of mean than, than you are being an outlier and someone who's really hitting a lot of home runs. So what I'm trying to say is, is success isn't how we imagine it where, when you actually find some. Right. Yeah. I, I, I get, I think I get what you're, where you're going. Like I used to, um, I used to be big into GAN and I, um, you know, I had a, I, I was, tr GAN basically claimed to have the secret to the universe. And so he never would have losers or rarely would have losers. And so a lot of people have gone down this rabbit hole where if you can just see the universe like GAN did, then you're, then everything will, you know, you'll know exactly where the euro is going to go and you'll make all these winning trades. And, and then, the, you know, the, the New York Times reporter that followed GAN around, noted that he had 22 out of 23 trades that month were all successful and this and that. Well, I, I, I'm not sure about this, but I do believe that if you dig close to some of the algorithms, that some of these high-frequency algorithms that some of the, the uh, banks and the well-heeled funds have, and a really good book for people who haven't read it is, is there's one called The Predictors where it's about a bunch of physicists who got into the trading game and had to learn <laughs> – had to learn some obvious lessons the hard way. But in the end, I think they made it work. And I think if you look at things like that, I think it can be kind of what you're talking about, Darren. Like, 
if you have a fund and you build this algorithm and it's got all these complicated equations and you're using nonlinear um, or chaos theory and stuff like that and you've got to have your server right next to the exchange and you know so you cut down on on latency and all that these sorts of things I think can be maybe kind of what we think trading is all about perhaps I'm not sure about that but I think so and then what you're talking about is basically, so where do we find our edge? And I think you're absolutely right. Generally speaking, because we don't have all of those sorts of advantages or you know resources, like to hire a bunch of PhDs from Harvard to write our nonlinear equations for the uh, you know for the for scalping the pound or whatever, <laughs> we end up trading quite simple, robust strategies which aren't probably what you thought you'd be doing in the first place you thought you'd be you know lining up venus with gans theory and so that you didn't have a loser this year and that sort of thing so i i think that's i think that's true but i think it's just kind of out of necessity that we have to trade these simple robust systems i do think that part of the um frustration that comes when you're trading these simple robust systems is that they tend to work in specific types of markets. So you might have a system that works really, really well, for example, if the market's not trending, if it's not in a strong trend. Or you might have a system that works really, really well if the market's quite volatile, but but doesn't work if the market's quiet and not and not really moving around much. So So these sorts of um, things come up. And if you understand your system well, you'll know it, in what type of market it, it will work well and what type of market it won't work well. The problem is you don't really know what type of market you're in until you're in it. <laughs> so so you can look back and say, yeah, yeah, I can see why I lost all that money last week, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and, the, and, the, and the markets never stay in the same phase, do they? So they go from trending to directionless and back to trending again and, and they go from volatile to quiet and then back to volatile again so they kind of flip-flop but um I, th I think that's how i see it I, is it is it you know it probably is kind of what we think it of trading in the beginning if you get into these these algorithms that uh, that are created and these these magic sort of things that the, that the funds and the physicists come up with and and that sort of thing and but we end up you're right we end up trading simple things and then um, we have to deal with the consequences, which, of course, is that um, not every trading system works in the same market. In fact, different trading systems like different types of markets. So, yeah. Can I ask you about your, your thoughts on um, discretion when it comes to, to rule breaking? Is the, is the sort of seemingly popularity of discretion because people can't stick to rules and they want to be able to have that ability to leave certain things undecided or um you know that ability to pick the rule that they they at the particular time they don't want to follow is it because of that or is there a real advantage in discretion i i like discretion but i like the choices to be clearly defined you know and i think if you believe that discretion is helpful and valuable then you know you should be able to kind of wrap some rules around when and, and why you're using that discretion that's that's my opinion on it but I see they just kind of instantly believe that discretion is is a good thing and I, I don't know whether that is because you know everyone else or not everyone a lot of people already think it's a good thing or you know or whether it really it's just nice to be able to have that option to break rules and then have a reason to to explain why you break the rules yeah i think you're right i think if you've got a really good discretionary idea that should translate into a rule but i think that there's two things going on with with discretion number one is that when you get to the point where you're, you you know what you're doing as a trader and it comes with experience, then your discretion becomes more important. In the beginning, your discretion is is working against you. That's what I believe. I believe that your gut, that, that gut instinct that you have as a trader when you first start trading is working against you. And that's why they told the turtles, you know, if you have two trades and you don't know which one to take, take the one that you, that you like the least. That's why they told him that because that's that tends to be true. And that was my experience. I don't know if everyone listening to this had that experience. But when you first start trading, you often have the wrong instincts. Now, the other, the other side of that coin is that as you become more 
experienced, what happens is it's difficult to access conscious knowledge of what you're doing. So it's better to make sure that as you as you grow as a trader that you, you create your rules as you go because sometimes what happens is you'll talk to a trader and you'll say, well, why did you do that? Why did you, why did you get out of the trade there? That doesn't fit your rules or what, you know, it doesn't really make sense why you would get out at that point. And the, and the trader can't really tell you. Just say, well, look, it's obvious. Can't you see that you knew it was going to go down, so you had to get out there or whatever it is. And that sort of thing comes up again. And so what's happening is some traders, when we get to that area, that, that level of you've had so much experience, you kind of know what you, you want to do and, and what you're doing, but you, you can't really articulate it. And it, it's difficult. It's really, it's really good if you can, you can write those rules down as you're getting through that intermediate phase. But the, the other side, the other thing about this, I think, about discretion, and this is the real danger, is that we all, I believe, we all, have, and I think there's really good evidence for this, that we all kind of have these self-sabotage ingrained in us <laughs> for whatever reason, from, from wherever it came from in you know, previous uh, years and, and things that are basically attacking us. And those are in our subconscious, and those are allowed to bubble up and affect our trading and affect our account balance when we say, well, I, you know, I'm a discretionary trader. It's just an open door for these suckers to flood out and kill your account. So that's the other piece here and why I think you're right, Darren. It's so critical to have these rules, these discretionary rules sort of encapsulated as a real rule, as, it's, as a written rule that you can look at and say, well, am I doing this or not? And I think the very best ones are that way. The problem is that they can, they can be these destructive tendencies that we have can come masquerading as, as discretionary uh, trading decisions. And I, and I think that's the difficult piece here. So I think that any serious trader knows that you know there are some deep subconscious, whether they call it subconscious thoughts, doesn't really matter. The point is, all the serious traders are working on themselves, and they're and they're working on their psychology, and they're trying to and they're trying different techniques, different things. It doesn't have to all be the same thing. They're doing different things to t to try and work through this, whether it means you know seeing a hypnotist or seeing a shrink or journaling or whatever your chosen tool is. You're doing something that's meant to help you rein these in, I guess, so to speak. So yeah, so that's kind of how I see it. And I think, I think you've hit on the ma the major point, I think, is what you've hit on here is that if you have discretionary rules, then you should be able to encapsulate these as, as a written rule. It should be something that you can write down and point to and say, okay, that's my rule. It can't really be one of those things where you say, well, this is kind of I, I just have to go with my gut here. I don't I don't think that in the end is gonna work because again, like I said, I think you have some of these other issues that are they're gonna come up and, and um and possibly um you know drastically affect your account balance. Cool. So are we kind of in agreed then really that in general rule breaking is a bad idea and you should really stick to your rules over the long run and if you are gonna change them then that really should be um, not in the moment. It should be based on something that you've seen to, to be true over over a longer period of time. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So, what would you like? What would you suggest in terms of like a process? It sounds like kind of what I hear is there's a process that you might go through to change your rules. So you can't just go one day. All right, I'm going to change my rule. I'm going to do this now because you know the last three trades that happened. So I need to create a new rule. There's probably some sort of process that you'd have to to go through to vet that rule and to justify it and to you know maybe look at some data and say okay well this seems to make sense now so we'll we'll add this rule or we'll change this rule. Um, oh, that's um, it's a difficult one really. I th I think you have to do a large sample size, so you have to do a lot of back testing, and I think you need to you need to when you do that compare maybe two or three different versions of that rule and especially the one that you're the ones that you're using at the moment because it's really easy to see a small period of time where almost the opposite of your rule just works absolutely beautifully and usually when the rule you're using at the time is is working really badly and it's very easy to think that um, you've actually found a, a better rule, but all you've done is, is curve fitted something 
to that small um, piece of data. And, you know, I, I suffer from that myself. And you know, generally what I do is I, I go over a, as large a period as I can and compare three or four different rules. And you know, often what I'll find is that all four of the rules are actually good. And, you know, the one that sort of really does well in a certain period, it's not necessarily the best rule to use over over the long period. So really, it's, it's a lot of getting your hands dirty and looking at much larger data samples. You know, that's kind of as far as I can go. I know there's like there's there's people who've gone really deep on how to sort of back test and, and define rules well. And, you know, that is is kind of beyond me. But but that that's the process I have used and seems to work fairly well for me. Yeah. And I think it makes a lot of sense. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, so. One concrete example for people would be of what you just said, which is, you know, sometimes you can find these situations where you're, it's very easy to find situations where your rule uh, doesn't work well. And so the opposite of your rule would actually work quite well on that, on that set of, of trades. So for example, let's say that you had a system where you were using a trailing stop. Well, you might find a situation where you have several trades in a row, many trades, in fact, where you would have been much better off not using the trailing stop and using some sort of profit target. Now, the problem is, if you look at the long, t- and I, you know, I'm I'm just like anyone else. I love to take profit, <laughs> but so one of the things that happens is you you miss out if you if you give up on using that trailing exit, you miss out on the huge winners that will occasionally happen, and that adds a big chunk of profit to your account that you would otherwise miss out on if you were simply using profit targets because the market would hit your profit target and then keep going for you know for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pips so you would miss you would miss the boat on that so that's one thing i think that that you know you can point to and say concrete example this is example of what you're talking about darren which is you know sometimes uh it seems like your rules is is not a good rule and all these trades show you that the rule doesn't really work that well and it needs to be changed but the big picture of course is that no the rule is fine it just happens to be a situation where you know the recent history doesn't really um, show you the the value or the importance of the rule so yeah so yeah so that this has been a really interesting session i think that um i would just to sum up i would say you really want to you really want to set yourself up in a situation where you can you can maintain your efficiency by trading your rules as often and as well as possible and that you, you want to make sure that you're taking good records as you're building your trading system so that you you realize what you're doing because when you get to a certain point it's it's not consciously accessible it's one of those things that it kind of becomes like if you were trying to teach someone how to drive it's difficult if you've been driving for a long time it's difficult but if you've just learned how to drive it's probably not as difficult for you to realize what you're doing and how you're interpreting the data on the road and the same thing with trading and so the other thing I would say is that if you are using any kind of discretion, I agree with Darren that it should be able to be written as a rule. I think that's the best discretionary rules are in, in that sort of form that you can, you can write them down and, and look at them and that you should be wary of, of adding new rules or adjusting and changing your rules because that could simply be some sort of subconscious destructive thing trying to work its way into your trading. So, of course, we want to keep – maintain um, – I, I think we, as traders, we want to maintain uh, a vigilant outlook for those sorts of things because they can easily creep into our trading and really wreck a system and wreck an account. So it's something I think we need to be aware of. But that's, that's basically how I would sum it up. Yeah, and, and for me, you know, something that is, is really obvious to me is – I can pretty much get away with making one mistake rule break a week and it not really affect my profit. If I do two or three or any more than that, I find the chances of me coming away with a profitable week when my my strategy made profit get re- reduced uh, dramatically. So, you know, so for me, you know, get some good rules, understand why those rules make profit over the long run. And then just stick to them. Yeah, that's that's great advice, Darren. Thank, thanks so much for your time. And we will see you next time when we talk about ways to improve your trading. Thanks, Walter.